All right, so tonight I'm going to talk about uh, how I am using ecological data to improve uh, conservation strategies for, for native plant pollinator systems. Uh, the ecological data that I'm talking about comes from my uh, research lab at UMass Dartmouth, so more formal scientific research, uh, but it also comes from uh, my Becology uh, Citizen Science Project, so it comes from, from you. Um, and um, and so I'll talk a bit more about that project later in the talk, and I'm hoping at the end of the talk, you know, you'll be motivated to, to, to join the project. I, I'm going to start with a, a bit of introduction um, to plant pollinate, what are plant pollinator systems, because I think there's a lot of misinformation out there, and uh, particularly with the word, or I guess misunderstanding, when it comes to the term pollinator, um, you know, term pollinators used all the time. And I give a lot of these talks and ask people for a definition of pollinator, and I have yet to get uh, the proper definition. And uh, that tells me that there's a problem out there with what exactly are we trying to help and why are we trying to, to help certain animals. And we talk about pollinators, people immediately think of bees, and that's where the why it matters comes into and how it comes into my talk. But I'm hoping you'll see today that it's, you know, the, the more than just the buzz comes from you know, it's not about the bee um, itself. Certainly protecting individual species is important. But what's important when it comes to bees and other things that we'll talk about is their functional role as pollinators. And there's a big difference between saving bees and saving their functional role as pollinators. We talk about them as pollinators. There are two contexts. There's the agricultural context, which is certainly important, but there's the ecological context as well, which I'll talk about today. And those are two, two different completely different beasts altogether. Um, so what, what do I mean by not just a pollinator, but I use the term pollination system because it forces you to think of that functional role. The term pollinator is typically applied to anything that we see visiting a flower. And, and that's really missing the point to the point where it's, it's affecting conservation. So what is the difference between a, a flower visitor and a pollinator? And what is a pollination system? How, how are those things interconnected? So starting with, with flower visitors, a wide variety of animals visit flowers to feed on the nectar and pollen. We could think of the nectar as their, their source of fuel that keeps them going. So a bumblebee, for example, can live approximately 24 hours without a source of, of, of fuel. So we could give them sugar water or nectar. Um, pollen is the source of protein. And when it comes to bees, in order the way you make new bees is through pollen. So they need a source of pollen. To, to reproduce and nectar is their fuel. We'll think about that, but it's not just bees. There are about 200,000 uh, flower visiting uh, species of flower visiting animals uh, globally. And when we look at the animals visiting flowers, the vast majority of them are insects. So out of the 200,000, about a thousand are, are vertebrates like the hummingbird. You know, there's some bats and, and some small mammals that act as, as um, that will visit flowers for nectar as well. Um, and, and feed on the flowers and, and act as pollinators, which we'll get to in a second. For now, we're just focused on the animals. So these animals, the environment that they face searching for food, either the nectar, pollen, or both, you, you can see it in, in the background. So they've got a wide variety of flowers to choose from, and they need to decide which ones are, have the, offer the best source. So are, the, are the, the most profitable when it comes to, to, to nectar and pollen. And you can imagine that we've got lots of choices, but we also have lots of insects, um, lots of other animals competing, either the same species or different species, all competing for this limited resource. So there's a lots of competition going on. Um, these resources change very rapidly over time and space. And one of the misconceptions out there is that, you know, these insects, because they have such a tiny brain, are innately attracted to certain colors. So we'll plant blue flowers for bees and we'll plant white flowers for moss. And that, you know, although that's true, um, the vast majority of species aren't pre-programmed. They need the flexibility to be able to track these resources over time and space. And the way they do that is through learning and memory. Um, and the way that we can separate these innate preferences from the learning and memory. So they're learning to associate colors or odors or, or shapes with, uh, with reward is we can bring them into the lab like we do, like shown here with the monarch butterfly that we brought into the lab. You touch the legs of the monarch butterfly with a cotton swab soaked with sucrose solution and they have an innate um, reflex. Their tongue sticks out looking for that reward, similar to Pavlov and, and his dogs. 
We can then show the butterfly a color, shape. We can introduce an odor or a combination of, of color and odor um, for a few seconds and then um, touch the, the cotton swab to the legs to get that tongue extended. As soon as that, that proboscis or tongue touches this, the sucrose solution, the butterfly forms an association. If it had an innate preference, it would be sticking out its tongue looking for that reward as, as the stimulus is presented. We can then test the effect of this pairing by showing it different colors. One, uh, you know, blue is, is separate from the yellow. Um, the orange is closer in color. Um, and we don't see a response, but as soon as we show the, the test color, right away that butterfly starts looking for, for the reward. And these butterflies can remember, you know, a monarch that's uh, migratory, you know, is living quite a while, can remember that yellow has reward for a month. I can change it so that yellow no longer contains reward and blue's rewarding. And so even though, you know, they have the brain the, the size of a pinhead, there's a lot of learning and memory um, or, or there's a lot of um, learning going on and, and that's governing their, their choice behavior. The other thing is that, that these species to compete, they have adaptations, right? So we, one of the easiest to see is, is tongue length. So if we look over here at the goldenrod, goldenrod to get to the nectar, basically anything lands on the flower and starts poking around, it's gonna be able to access the nectar. And we can see the tongue of this Bombus and Patience worker um, um, probing the nectar. The other end of things though, we have flowers like this um, impatience, capensis, jewelweed flower where the nectar is located at the base of this long spur. These short medium tongue bees that could get nectar from our goldenrod, they can't access the nectar in a, a, um, a jewelweed because their tongue isn't long enough. They, they can't get to the base to get to the nectar. Um, our Bombus fervidus, that was the bumblebee that was visiting um, this impatience flower, has a, a really long tongue and can wrap its tongue around and get access to that nectar. So this type of flower is excluding um, these short to medium tongue bees, right? So they're looking for the flowers that match their tongue length. And this Bombus fervidus isn't going to compete with short to medium tongue bees on this goldenrod because... Um, you know, its tongue gets in the way, it's less efficient. So it, it's looking for these tubular flowers. And this is gonna become very important, this separation of resources and these adaptations that, that, that um, species have to better exploit and compete and find these resources. Um, we're gonna start to think about that when it comes to, to helping to, to conserve the system and also the fit between the animal and the, and the flower. So if these animals, as they're traveling through the environment, so if and only if, while they're going from flower to flower, they transfer pollen, and that pollen transfer leads to fertilization, the production of seed, and we can throw fruit in there. Um, then and only then can we change that animal's name from a flower visitor to a pollinator. And this is where you know, people define pollinators any an animal that moves pollen, but that's that's not the important part. The important part is the fertilization because pollination is a process and that's how plants reproduce. So if you don't have plant reproduction going on, you can't call it a pollinator. And there are many cases where um, animals will transfer pollen, but it won't lead to fertilization and production of seeds and fruit. For example, let's say this plant, um, so we have a, a bee or, or, or butterfly moving up the inflorescence from flower to flower, transferring pollen, from the male to the female to the stigma, which is the female reproductive organ. Um, there's lots of pollen transfer going on, but if this plant is self-compatible, meaning uh, self-incompatible, meaning it can't receive its own pollen, um, it, it can't be fertilized by its own pollen, then we've got pollen transfer without any reproduction going on. Similarly, if our bee or butterfly moved to this other species, it's gonna transfer pollen to the stigma of this species, but it's not gonna to lead to pollination. In fact, it's a cost, a reproductive cost to both the donor and the recipient plant, right? The pollen's being wasted. It's like wasting male gametes. And what happens is the foreign pollen blocks the surface of the stigma and prevents it from receiving its own pollen. So there's a major cost. What plants want, right? There's a strong selection for plants to get those animals to move pollen to another um, individual of the same species preferably an unrelated individual. That's the way that they can maximize reproductive success. And this is called outcrossing. So plants have many adaptations to get their animals, to get animals that to, to do this outcrossing, to maximize their, their um, pollen transfer efficiency. 
And so if we look at a plant and all of the animals that pollinate it, that combination is referred to as a pollination system. And this is where things become a bit complicated because there are animals that will visit the flower and not do any pollinating. And there are some that do. And when it comes to, and we'll see in a few slides why this is important, feeding the bee is very different than, 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 than having pollination or, or attracting a pollinator is very different. That process of pollination is very different than just feeding an animal. So to give you an example of what I mean by this, here we have two bumblebees, Bombus fervidus and Bombus um, affinus, visiting obedient plant. So our Bombus fervidus has a long tongue. The nectar is located at the base of the flower. The fervidus goes into the flower, makes contact with the male and female reproductive organs, lead, leading to fertilization and production of seed. So our Bombus fervidus, then we can classify as a pollinator. Here we have Bombus affinus, and Bombus affinus has a really short tongue, but Bombus affinus has a trick, right, to help it to compete. On tubular flowers, it bites a, a, a hole in the base of the flower, right? It's got a short tongue, so it can't get the nectar going in legitimately. And it robs the flower, bites a hole and, and robs the nectar. And so our Bombus uh, aphnus then is a flower visitor. In fact, if we if you look at it in terms of the cost of the plant, it's actually a parasite, right? It's receiving something, a benefit, the nectar, um, but it's not giving the plant anything in return. In fact, it's, it's, it's conferring a cost to that plant because um, it's not pollinating. And in addition, when it takes the nectar, our Bombus fervidus, which is a good pollinator, is gonna visit the flower and it's not gonna have any nectar and, the, and Bombus fervidus is just gonna go find another, another plant. So I could have hundreds and hundreds of Bombus affinus visiting my obedient plant and I don't have any pollination and so I don't have a pollinator. And I can't change the name of my Bombus affinus to a pollinator until I have a plant that it actually pollinates. We can't hope. Certainly Bombus aphanus can function as a pollinator, but if we don't have the plant, then it's lost its function. And so we're feeding Bombus aphanus, but we have no functional role as pollinator. And this is a, an extremely um, important point that people tend to see things on flowers, bees in particular, and say, oh, uh, you know, this is a great pollinator plant. The term pollinator plant really is, and hopefully you can see that that's really meaningless. There are plants that are pollinated and if the pollinators are present, then you know you have some, some pollination going on. Similarly, I could, and what's interesting about this is that Bombus aphanus is the poster child for pollinator decline when it's, it doesn't really pollinate tubular flowers. It's, it's, it's considered more of a, like the plants are trying to deter Bombus aphanus because it's of the reproductive costs. Um, similarly, I could replace my, my obedient plant with a feeder. I could feed all the bees in the world, let's say. I could feed my Bombus aphanus and restore it throughout its native range and, and, and keep that species going. Again, I've got Bombus aphanus, but I have no pollinators, right? Because I don't have any plants, I've got a feeder. And, and so this, we're going to see why this understanding who's actually pollinating the plants, that this, this issue really comes down not to the bee, but to the plants. It's the plants that are important and specifically native plants that are important because those native plants are the bridge between the bee and wildlife. Those plants are the ones that are supporting the diversity that the bee or butterfly or whatever is pollinating is helping it. So we need to start to think about not just the bee, but the bee plant as a unit. And that's why I refer to it as pollination system. I don't have a problem with the term pollinator, but I do have a problem with the way people use the term pollinator and they, they don't understand or or see the importance of the plant so the pollination system forces them to think of the plant and the animals that are actually pollinating the plant and not just the animals visiting the plant so to put this into perspective here we've got penstem and digitalis and so one of my grad students um chelsea hettering is um is is this is part of her project she's looking at um how important animal pollination is to penstem and so what she did was she bagged flowers and left some bags so they didn't receive any visits by by an animal and that's shown down here and there was some fruit produced but but there was no seed this line shows you the fruit weight that's needed to start producing seed you can see that um that clearly our our penstem needs um an animal uh pollinator to to help it to reproduce um in the open treatment what what we did was just unbag flowers and let a whole bunch of, of animals visit. You can see that 
that the fruit weight increases and there's a lot of seeds produced. So this is the best case scenario, just, just, just letting them visit at will. But the other thing that we did was we bagged them and let the first and, and unbag the flower and the first animal that visited, we then rebagged the flower to see what impact those individuals would you, you could have. You could see that many of the smaller bees that are visiting, frequently visiting these flowers, aren't doing any pollinating. And there are one or two like this Bombus vegans that after a single visit is able to to um to, to produce seeds equivalent to some of the open pollination that was going on and so we could see you know you may see a dozen different bees on penstemon but only a couple are actually doing the the pollinating and so i could remove bombus vegans from the equation and have lots of bees but no pollination so no plant reproduction um, and if, so if we look at these pollination systems, you know, as I, as I mentioned, there's, there's a lot of tension on bees because they're important in an agricultural context, but in ecological context, all of these systems are equally important. So some plants are looking for small bees, some are looking for large bodied bees, some are looking for long tongued animals, some are looking for short tongued animals. Some of these systems are generalized, which means that many different um, animal types can function as pollinators and some are highly specialized like this, this um, system down here. There's a fly species and a plant species. If we lose the plant, um, the fly species goes extinct. If we lose the fly, the plant species goes extinct. Um, and some of these plant species are, are highly tuned to their most efficient pollinator. So here we have a hummingbird pollinated plant species and you notice that the pollen's deposited on the forehead of the hummingbird. Why? Because if the plant deposited on the wings, it wouldn't be a very efficient way to transfer um, pollen. As the nectar is located at the base of the flower, the hummingbird moves into place and brushes its forehead with pollen against the female reproductive organ. And that's how the plant achieves pollination by um, taking advantage of the behavior and, the, and the, the, the morphology of the hummingbird. Here we can see that a, a bumblebee pollinating uh, pollinator of, of uh, Prunella vulgaris you see that the pollen is deposited on the thorax of the bee. Why? Because it's harder for that bee to groom the pollen off. Here we have butterflies, and we don't think of butterflies as efficient pollinators, but there are many plants that are butterfly pollinated that depend on butterflies for reproduction. And here we can see um, that butterflies do transfer pollen and carry pollen on their bodies. All those little specks, if you can see them, that's all pollen grain. So we have a wide range of these systems. And the reason that this system diversity is so important is because they are building blocks. So here we separate out pollination in an agricultural context with pollination in an ecological context. In an agricultural context, we have a handful of bee species that are functioning as the pollinators, right? The, the, the main one is not native, right? The honeybee isn't native, but the honeybee is in large numbers. So a single hive, let's say it has 50 individuals. That's a lot of bees. The largest bumblebee nest that I've seen is 2,000 um, individuals, right? Just to put it into perspective. Those bees in agricultural context, so there's a handful of bees that are pollinating a handful of plant species that aren't native. They may have had native ancestors, but we've manipulated them for our benefit, right? So the pollination that's going on is benefiting one species and that's us, which is clearly important. Two out of every three bites of food we take, that's a number thrown around. It comes from a pollinator, that's true. But only about 5%, let's, you know, less, let's, I, I can move it up to 10 to be very generous, but only 10% of, of native bees are actually functioning as pollinators. Why? Because the nectar, it's, they're not great sources of nectar and pollen. Um, and so we get the honeybees to do that because um, there's large numbers. And also we have monoculture. We have acres and acres of one thing that's blooming for two weeks. And, and they can, because of the numbers, it's a numbers game, they can swap the system and get all that pollination um, completed, right? So it's, it's ideal in an agricultural context, all that matters is abundance. We need to find something to reach our pollination thresholds to give us the fruit production that we need. Right, but it's very linear, it's not diverse. When we flip things to an ecological context, it's all about diversity. Certainly abundance is important, but it's about diversity. Why? In the agricultural context, the pollination is feeding one species. In an ecological context, the pollination is supporting thousands, hundreds of species, entire systems. And the way that it does that is you can imagine that every native plant is producing a different type of seed. 
And these different types of seeds are preferred by different types of small mammals and birds. And um, the plant material is providing shelter and nest sites for, um, for some of these animals. And these animals then are serving as food for predatory species. And so as you can imagine, all of these systems are supplying a diversity of foods that's supporting diversity at these different trophic levels. And as we start to erode these systems, that we're going to start to affect these other trophic levels. And eventually we're going to get to the, a point where we've eroded the systems. We, we don't have the diversity we need to support the diversity of these other trophic levels. And we're going to get what's called ecosystem collapse. And so some may say, well, who cares? So yes, we're going to lose some animals, but you know, as long as we have enough pollination for agriculture, we're, we're being supported. Well, the problem is that these diverse, healthy ecosystems um, provide us with what are called ecosystem services. These are, these are services that we get from nature for free that we completely take advantage of, right? So water purification, carbon sequestration, soil decomposition, all of these important processes come from healthy and diverse ecosystems. And so we need diversity in these systems to supply us with these services. And if we lose the services, some of them we're not even going to be able to replace. And if we can, there's going to be a hefty price tag associated with it. So there's, there is a, a, a significant dollar value associated with um, ecological conservation of, of plant pollinator systems. But the attention has overwhelmingly been on the agricultural side of things. And many of the conservation measures used in agriculture, are they're, they're being trying to, people are trying to use them in an ecological context, and it's just not going to work. You have to change your view on things. And, and that's where my research comes in into um, the equation. So how is it that we're going to build biodiversity? Again, this is going back to that example I gave you with the bumblebees and the obedient plant, just giving you hummingbirds as an example. So here we've got, you know, Monarda, um, uh, Monarda uh, plant that's pollinated by hummingbirds. And so we've got a lot of Monarda plants and then everybody loves their hummingbird feeders and hummingbird feeders Certainly, when from the perspective of, of protecting hummingbirds, it's you know great. It's one-stop shopping, and if the hummingbird has a choice between visiting a, a, a thousand uh, Monarda flowers or going to a feeder and filling up, it's it's you know birds aren't stupid. They're going to go for the feeder. The problem with that again is that we're yes we are helping the hummingbirds, but we're losing their functional role as pollinators. And it turns out that Monarda is the host plant for the orange mint moth, and orange mint moth adults are a good source of food for eastern whippoorwills, which is a bird species of conservation concern. Purple finch likes to eat. Oh, sorry. Purple finch likes to eat the seeds. Um, there are birds that love to eat the larval stage of of moths and, and butterflies, and so. If we have our hummingbirds, they're happy, but look at all of the diversity that we're losing by, um, geez, I don't know why that keeps switching, all the diversity that we are not supporting. So that's the difference between supporting hummingbirds and supporting their functional role as pollinators. Similarly, if I introduce a, um, an ornamental species, a non-native species, or um, a cultivar or something that's been modified, um, I may get, so our hummingbird may like the nectar and it may actually pollinate, but the problem is that the birds don't wanna eat the seeds, the moss and butterflies don't wanna use it as a host plant. And so effectively what I'm doing by, by supporting these non-natives is putting up feeders where I'm helping the animal in some cases, but I'm losing that functional role. And so we need to start to shift our thinking, again, this is why pollination system and using that term is important because it's that system that is the building block, not the animal, not the bee by itself. It's the bee plant interaction, native plant interaction that's supporting that other native wildlife. So the problem is that I hinted at that, you know, these systems are being degraded at an alarming rate globally, both from the animal side of the equation and the plant side of the equation. So here's some data from um, Massachusetts that I've collected on bumblebees. So I went to the museum specimens, went back to the same location and resurveyed. And you can see that, so pre-2000s blue bars, yellow bars more recent. You can see in many cases, the yellow bars are lower than the blue bars. In some cases like Bombus aphanus, it's likely locally extinct, although I still have hope that there are a few, um, there's a small population um, still present in the state. Um, similarly in butterflies, so this is Mass Butterfly Club data that I analyzed recently. You can see there are many species that are, are um, 
declining over from 2010 to 2018. And if we switch over to, to there are many native plant species that are, are um, in decline. So certainly um, things are in trouble, but what I wanna point out here, I think more importantly, people think that everything's in trouble and that's simply not the case. So if we look at the bumblebees, there are many bumblebee species that are um, equally or more abundant than they were historically. They're expanding their ranges. The same thing's going on with butterflies, the same thing's going on with uh, non-bumblebee bees, so other bees, and the same thing's going on with native plants. And so if we want to start conserving these pollination systems, we have to, we, we can't use a one-size-fits-all approach. And unfortunately, that's the case. People are putting plants out that, yes, are going to support common species, but they're completely missing the species that actually need help. And so what I started to do was to collect data to figure out what these species of conservation concern actually need, and then reintroducing them into the, into the environment to see what impact it has. Um, and so what I'm taught when I talk about an ecological approach, so there are a lot of projects out there looking at bees and butterflies and where they are, but, but what I'm doing and what, and why what I'm doing is different. And I feel, um, extremely important is that I want to know what those bees and butterflies are doing. Um, what are they visiting? Uh, what are they using as host plants? Where are they nesting? So we can get data at the species level because all species are, are different. If they were all the same, they would outcompete each other and we'd be left with one species. So we know that they're different because they're here. We just need to figure out what those differences are. So in butterflies, and what we want to do is understand their complete life cycle. So not just the flowers, that's one small aspect of their life cycle. But there are other things that we don't give them that they're not going to be able to persist. It's going to affect populations and drive population decline. So for butterflies, they, they need host plants, they need nectar plants. So you can have the most beautiful butterfly garden on the planet, but if you don't have host plants, you're not going to get the butterflies, right? The host plants have to be close enough to the nectar plants so that they can complete their life cycle. With bees, they need a place to overwinter. They need a place to nest. Right? They also need good sources of nectar and pollen, and it turns out that bees use different plants for nectar, some plants for nectar, some plants for pollen. Um, for the plants, right? so flipping things over to the plant side, we need to understand who's how dependent are these plant species on pollinators, on animal animals for pollination, and who are the major pollinators? Are they in decline? So understanding plant um, mating systems is extremely important. And again, this is at the species level. Uh, so as I mentioned, you know, so I was, um, brief history, I was at UMass. So I've studied plant pollinator systems for, I don't know, 30, 30 years-ish. Um, some of that time I spent focused on monarch butterfly migration and I couldn't focus on bees. And this is right around when the bee declines um, started to ramp up. And so I wasn't allowed to work on bees when I was working on monarch butterflies. My advisor um, didn't approve. So when I finished um, that position, I could get back to the bees. I noticed that there were a lot of plant lists that were being distributed. And I looked at these lists and I knew the species that were in decline because Bombus aphanus started to decline as, you know, going way back when I was a PhD student. I saw Bombus aphanus. It was the most abundant species at one of my sites. Two years later, I couldn't find it within 100 miles of my site. So that species declined extremely rapidly. And I saw those declines. Um, but I looked at these plant lists and I noticed that the plants that, that were being promoted were not supporting the bee species in, in decline. They were completely in disconnect. Certainly they'd su support something and a lot of something, mostly honeybees at the time. Um, and so what I did was I went out and started to collect data to figure out what are um, the floral preferences for these, these species of conservation concern. So I did some preliminary studies at a bunch of field sites across Massachusetts, and I you know, would walk transects and formally collect data, rigorous scientific data on, on bumblebee flower interactions, noted the species, noted whether it was collecting nectar or pollen or both, was it a male, female worker? And I did these surveys from um, April, May, all the way through to, to October. Here are the bumblebee species that were um, the, the, um, the non-parasitic bumblebee species that uh, were historically native to, to Massachusetts. And the ones in red are the ones that are of, of um, conservation concern, meaning they're in decline. And um, 
And so I found some very interesting data early on. There were definitely some patterns. There were definitely were some preferences that were not reflected in the plant list that I was seeing from other pollinator conservation groups. Um, but again, it was a limited data set. I could only get to so many field sites. And I thought, what's a good way to collect data? Everybody's interested in pollinators. So I created the Becology Citizen Science Project to help me collect the, um, these ecological data. So bumblebee flower interaction data. I teamed up with some faculty at Worcester Polytechnic Institute. We developed the Becology web app where people could take a short video, um, which really helps um, to, to um, increase the accuracy of, of the BID and the plant ID and, and also allows you to look at the behavior with a still photo won't allow you to, to figure out what, what the behavior is. Is it collecting nectar or pollen, which is extremely important information to know. Um, and so we, we, I launched the Becology Citizen Science Project. And, and as I mentioned, to help that, we've got this Becology app I'll talk about. We've ex expanded it to include butterflies, and I'll talk about that in a little bit. Um, but it really is it's user friendly. It goes into the database, and you can look at your observations on a map. And you can also look at patterns between the bumblebee species and the plant species, right? So looking at those interactions, which is, as I said, is, is the focus um, of the project and what separates us from some of the other projects that are out there. All right, so what I found early on, here are some data from July at just one of the sites, right? If we look at the bumblebees, so the bumblebee species are down here on the X and the ones in red are the target species, so the ones of conservation concern. We divide them up into short, medium and long tongue species. And right away, you can see that there's a clear separation based on tongue length alone, right? Long tongue bees are on tubular flowers. This isn't surprising to anybody that's studied bumblebee ecology or, or you know, flower visiting animals in general. Um, but what was interesting is that th within these categories, there were some long tongue species that showed some very clear preferences for certain plant species. So Bombus fervidus, most of what it was on was, was red clover and, and, and a bit of vetch. So this species is persisting. This species is still in the state because of red clover, um, which is a non-native. Um, and that's what's dominating most of these uh, abandoned agricultural fields. Um, but so our vegans is on prunella and also was on a um, Joe pie weed. Um, we see that Bombus and Patience, which is the most common um, bumblebee species uh, in this area, particularly later August, you'll see thousands of bees and 95% of them will be Bombus and Patience. Bombus and Patience loves white clover. None of these other medium um, tongue bees and um, are showing the same preference. So we're seeing these different preferences and it's not based on morphological features. It's based on um, what's in the nectar. Right, and, and that's another aspect of my research, which I'm not gonna focus on, but there are these clear patterns that we think are gustatory preferences. The other interesting thing that came out of this is that this is for nectar. For pollen, they were showing strong preferences for St. John's worts, for, for, for plants that aren't, uh, so they had separate plants for nectar and separate plants for pollen. It was very clear that they were all using the same plants for, for pollen. There was stronger competition for pollen plants than there were for nectar plants. Um, the other interesting thing is that when we look at the ecology data for the same month, right, we see the same patterns. So I'm seeing the same patterns in the ecology data that I'm seeing in my more formal scientific research. And this really helps to strengthen these, these preferences. So it makes me more confident that these preferences uh, do indeed exist. And so uh, what I did was compile a list of all these species. So, so, you know, in these different habitats, we've got um, different species combinations, and there are certain species that always come out on top, no matter what the other species are, and that really helps us to understand how strong those those preferences are. Why they have those preferences is a whole other matter, and, and you know we continue to do that that research in the lab. Uh, as I mentioned, because of the the success of of the Becology project and and the findings of of uh, my research, we expanded to butterflies with the idea that, well, it, we saw these species level preferences in bumblebees, I'm sure they're in butterflies. And so we launched the, um, the butterfly um, module of, of the app. So we teamed up with iNaturals for this. So again, you take a short video of a butterfly flower interaction, we'll help you ID the butterfly and the plant. And you can tell us whether it's, um, if it's, if it's laying eggs or if it's mating or if it's nectaring, so behavioral data, all that goes into the database now as well. And um, 
At the same time, I've got a graduate student that's looking at butterfly flower interactions. And, and so we're finding some, some interesting things in, in the butterfly data as well. I just, you know, it's constantly being updated, the 2000, um, 2022 data. Anyway, as I mentioned, we have in butterflies, we have the same situation as we do in, in bees. We have some species that are in decline, other species that are stable or increasing. And when we look at the data, um, so Annie Monroe has collected data over the past two years at multiple sites across the state. And we're seeing some very clear preferences. Right? So common ringlet, out of, uh, you know, has 100 observations of common ringlet, only 3% of the observations were um, ringlets on flowers with a long tube. So they are showing a preference for short to medium tube flowers. Um, we then look at the little glassy wing, which is a skipper. 50% of the visits are to long, 50 short. So it's more of a generalist when it comes to tube length. But then we look at the silver spotted skipper, which is one of the targets. 90% of the visits were to flowers with a long tube. And this is consistent across sites. So if we're putting out our mountain mints and our black eyed Susans and all these things that we think are helping, we're completely missing the target. No bum, long tongue bumblebees are going to visit black eyed Susan or mountain mint, right? Certain things do, honeybees and wasps love it. So you're going to get that abundance, but you're missing the diversity. In particular, you're missing the species of conservation concern. The other thing that was interesting is that some butterflies have a preference for certain plant families. So anything in the pea family seems to be preferred by the eastern tail blue, which is using it as a host plant and also as a nectar plant. Uh, the great sprangled uh, fritillary used violets as a host plant, and 100% of its visits were to native plants, right? And also for the clear wings, which a lot of people like, 98% of the visits were to native plants with a long tube. So it's showing a tube length preference and a preference for native plants. And so if you have a lot of non-natives with tubes, even if you have the host plant, odds are you're not going to see large numbers of, of these, these clear, clear wings. And so the, there are obvious implications for, for conservation with, with these, these patterns. And I suspect that if we were to look at other bees, we would see the same thing. And we'll expand the project to other bees in the future. The other thing we noticed was that there are certain native plants that have high conservation value, meaning they support a lot of these species of conservation concern, both bumblebees and butterflies. So Monarda fistulosa, right, alone supports all three bumblebee species of conservation concern, plus five, five butterfly species. Often you're seeing all of these species on at the same location at the same time. Um, Prunella vulgaris is another one where you don't have much Prunella vulgaris, but it's supporting a lot of these species of conservation concern. So um, just, just to look at these preferences and how they may fit into conservation, there's a lot of talk, there's, for whatever reason, there's this push for no mow may where we should leave our lawns because we have things in bloom and that's certainly helping, right? Well, it depends on what your goal is. If your goal is just to get something visiting flowers on your lawn, certainly if with white clover, you'll get honeybees, you'll get you know, common bees, but what you won't get are native skippers. You'll get um, European skippers, but you won't get those native skippers. And so what I did was I've, I've thrown seed on my lawn um, uh, and um, you know, a prunella seed on my lawn. So I've got prunella mixed in, the native prunella. And um, before it bloomed, there was lots of white clover, which blooms early. And I surveyed what was on the white clover. I let it go and surveyed what I was supporting. And as I mentioned, it's a lot of honeybees and a lot of, of um, common bumblebees. Um, but when this prunella came into bloom, um, I started to see native skippers. And I started to see, this is a picture of Bombus vegans, which is one of the targets on my lawn visiting prunella. And I didn't see any of these species visiting the white clover or the dandelion. So even if you have, and you can, you can see, I've got a sea of white clover and I've got very few prunella plants, yet that's enough to attract these species. That's how strong those, those preferences are. So all this information is into the plant list. I currently on my website, I've got the 22, 2022 plant list. The 2023, I'm putting the final touches on and it'll be, I'll be um, posting it soon within the next month. Um, there are some changes. The butterfly species, target species have changed. So the host plant list is gonna change a little bit. And there are a couple of other plant species that will be um, added to the list. Uh, but this plant's uh, list at this point is based on 20,000 observations and I am, confident that 
you know, these plant species um, will, will do, do their job in terms of supporting, like reconnecting, reforming these pollination systems. Um, or I was confident, but you, you never know. So what I did then was took um, the plant species on the list, and then I started to reintroduce them into the environment to see what impact uh, it would have. Uh, and, and so because of the success of Becology in terms of data collection, and that's ongoing, I created a second goal for Becology, and that is let's take the data and let's, let's translate uh, the data into conservation action. So get people to take the plants on the list and start to put them in the ground and see what impact it has. And then also to give the citizen scientists the tool to be able to identify the species that that what the species are before they make the change and what they uh, species are there after they make the change. For me, it's very important that you see that you've made a difference. I don't want you to trust me. I want you to, to do a pre post test. You know, that's where the science comes in and, and see the results for yourself. So I started to create these ecology conservation um, habitats all over the place. So here a couple Dartmouth and Southborough was, was my, um, one of my initial sites in Southborough. You can see what it was before, a lot of non-natives um, transformed into smallish areas. So I'd say large garden size areas um, containing plants on the list. And what was amazing, so this happened during COVID where a lot of people wanted to get out of the house. A lot of volunteers put plants in the ground. And so we put plugs and, and um, plants in the ground, so, so shrubs. And what we noticed is that year, some of those plants started to bloom and the first visitors to those flowers were the target species. So breakneck hill, for example, is 40 acres. Some years I go through breakneck hill and I don't see a single Bombus fervidus, which is this bumblebee up here. As soon as these plants started to bloom in these habitats, I saw Bombus fervidus visit the flowers, which was you know, remarkable. So what I'm showing on the slide, all of these pictures are target species visiting plant species at these um, sites in the first or second year of establishment. So the effects were remarkably um, um, rapid. And, and what I noticed, so that was the first year, the second, third year, what I'm noticing is I'm seeing more and more Bombus fervidus. So last year at Breakneck, I think we saw a dozen Bombus fervidus in these habitats. And as I mentioned, I, I've gone an entire year without seeing a single bombus fervus over, over uh, 40 acres. So the, uh, the, the res results have been uh, remarkable. So now I wanna change these, of, like, what can we do, right? And what, what can we do to, to help things or to contribute to the project? And it really comes down to, we can do the same thing at different spatial scales. So here's breakneck again. Um, here's the everything that you can see here is that's the 40 acres. It's filled with non-natives, veteran red clover mostly. Here's Becology down here, right? Here are two traditional pollinator habitats or pollinator gardens with lots of mountain mint and uh, black-eyed Susan. And you can see that over this entire area, there are 11 target uh, butterfly species and two target bumblebee species, which is pretty good over this large area. But over 200 meters, so that's 25,000 meters squared, over 200 meters squared, right, with the right plant species, I'm able to support eight of those target butterflies and two of the target bumblebee species. You can see that these other traditional pollinator gardens are doing as well because they, again, that match isn't there. So here is doing a bit better, three of the target butterflies, one bumblebee, but this one didn't have any of the target bumblebees and only two of the target butterfly species. So this, this shows a couple of things. First of all, that putting in the proper plants actually matters. And also that you don't need to change 40 acres to have an impact. You can do it at a much smaller, more manageable scale and still have a positive impact. The other thing that went on at break next, so here's Becology. This whole wetland area was filled with purple loosestrife. And purple loosestrife is, I mean, it was planted by beekeepers to support honeybees. And for good reason, there are thousands and thousands of honeybees visiting purple loosestrife in this area. Lots of common bumblebee species, some butterflies, but none of the bumblebee species of conservation concern. Again, because this, they've got long tongues and this isn't a, a tubular plant species. So what we did was remove the purple loosestrife. And three years after removing that loosestrife, what happened? All of the native plant diversity was unlocked. 
So here we've got mimulus, a native population of mimulus, and all these native plants down here replaced the purple loosestrife. They were being suppressed by that loosestrife. And this video, it's hard to see, but on one plant, this is Bombus vegans, and this bumblebee down here is Bombus fervidus, right? Not anywhere on that purple loosestrife, on the veteran red clover, if I see it at all, we allow the mimulus to come up and the first two bees on the same plant, which at this site was, was unheard of. And this is five years prior to doing this. I didn't see many of, of individuals from these two species. Um, so the other thing, just to, to, to put this in perspective with the honeybees, so honeybees don't like, they have a short tongue. So you can, if you put in tubular flowers, there isn't much competition unless you get a carpenter bee. So carpenter bees are native bees like Bombus aphanus and tricola, they bite holes, right? Once they to get the nectar because they have a short tongue. Once they make that hole, anything with a short tongue can get access. And the honeybees then take full advantage. And to show you what impact this has on native bees of conservation concern, here I've done surveys on, um, so this is Monarda rubra, this is at Lincoln um, Land Trust, the People for Pollinators um, Garden. And here are showing you the last week of July, we could see this is, these are the bumblebee species, Bombus fervidus, vagans, and Griseocolos were all visiting this plant, plus a few carpenter bees. You can see here the black bar. The following week, when I went to survey over a hundred honeybees in a single survey session, which is an incredible number of honeybees, all visiting these holes, so secondary robbing, and none of these, long tongue bees, both fervidus and, and vegans were gone. We didn't see any of them. They got pushed out of the out of the habitat to um, back to vetch and, and red clover. Honeybees looking at, I, I mentioned mount mint, honeybees love mount mint and how much do they love it? Well, here are some numbers. 100 honeybees, 12 common bumblebees, bombus and patients, no at-risk bumblebees. Um, goldenrod, 110 to, to 10 no at-risk bumblebees. And also if we look at other things visiting, there's not much else visiting. It's all honeybees. They swamp the system. It's a numbers game. And they're taking all that nectar and not leaving anything for uh, native bees and, and butterflies. So putting honeybees on conservation land, thinking that it's helping conservation is way off, right? As I mentioned, honeybees are extremely important in agriculture and agriculture only. There is no native plant that depends on a honeybee for pollination. So we should stop. I don't know where this came from, but the, but helping the environment by putting honeybees in your backyard um, is just, you know, it's, it's just untrue. All right. So what can we do at home on a smaller scale? Here is what I have in my yard. I have about a quarter of an acre. Um, this is what I have in my yard, and this is what it takes to support these, these species through the year. So we've got, early in the spring, we've got wood betony, uh, and I don't have a lot of space, and I certainly don't have a green thumb, um, but I'm able to support these um, nectar plants, and then I also have these, these pollen plants. And it's not, you know, it's not just the bumblebees. I haven't studied other bees, but they're not visiting these, these native plants in terms of bees and butterflies. And here's a shot of, of uh, another Bombus vegans on um, Prunella in my yard. The other thing that you can do at home, a lot of people want to keep their lawns. They don't want their neighbors to complain. And what you can do is, is um, selective mowing and strategically plant um, native plants, right? So here we've got my lawn, which looks like crap, but on purpose, right? So as long as I keep it cut, then the neighbors don't care. So I've cut back all the white clover that was shown in that previous slide. But what I did was I mowed around the prunella. So here I've got the resource maintained. It's a nice purple flower. So people aren't gonna complain aesthetically, it's pleasing. Yet I'm able to support the research resource just by selective mowing. On larger scales and conservation lands, I do the same thing. You should go in, you identify the native plants and you mow around them. And you manage those smaller populations of native plants to keep that in the environment. I put seeds around the base of trees so we can cut around the base and keep those Prunella uh, plants blooming. Here I've got some native willow and I also put some of the Prunella at the base of the native willow so that again, I can mow around and keep the, these um, small areas with the native plants and continue to support these species. Um, the lawn, uh, I, I don't wanna replace my lawn. Uh, I want these patches to exist. Why? Because here uh, native bees like to nest and here are some native bee nests, ground nesting bees um, on my property. 
So again, not a lot of space, but if you get the right plants in, um, you, you can make a difference. The other thing that I want to focus on, I talk a lot about flowers and that's just one aspect of what we're doing. We're trying to figure out, um, you know, nest sites, overwintering sites for, for bumblebees and, and other bees. Um, but what I want to point out is that, that things that aren't aesthetically, you know, as pleasing as a, a flowering plant, things like native grasses are extremely important, right? Most of the skippers use native plants uh, as native grasses as host plants. Native birds love um, native grass seed more so than non-native grass seed. And also these native grasses are um, good spots for rodents to nest. So why do we want rodents to nest? Aren't they a, a problem in spreading disease? Well, rodents are the major small mammals or the major food source for a lot of our bird species of conservation concern like, like our owls. Uh, so, um, and also, Bumblebees don't build their own nests. They use the abandoned nests of rodents or small cavities that have been created by other animals. And so if we have no rodents, we're not going to have any nest sites for bumblebees, and that's going to negatively affect the population. Um, the other part, the overwintering part, you know, people say leave your leaves. Why is that? Well, uh, we're not getting as much snow as we used to get due to global warming and, and other things. Um, so those leaves act as an insulating layer. So when we do get drops in temperature, the, the temperatures don't, those freezing temperatures don't go down to the level where these bees are overwintering. So bumblebees will dig their way down a certain distance and spend the winter there um, in hibernation. And, and so first of all, you need to have a nice loose loamy soil for those bees to dig down. If you have hard packed soil, they're not gonna be able to dig down. And then once they get down there, they need to be insulated because they can withstand cold temperatures, but not really cold temperatures. Uh, a lot of uh, butterflies and, and bumblebees are overwintering in, in you know, uh, logs or you know, here's a log pile. Um, some of them are nesting in, and, and um, overwintering in stems. So when we're going in to clean our yards, we get rid of the leaves, we start to mow everything to the ground, we're removing all of those, all of that habitat. The other thing is that a lot of people like to deadhead. And again, this, you know, they, they're really interested in pollinator conservation, yet they're deadheading. Well, the deadheading is removing seeds. The whole point of protecting the pollinators and saving the bees is to get those pollination products like seeds because they're feeding the birds and small mammals. So, you know, Thinking about system level, what are we trying to do? What's the goal? I think if we start to to think more systems level and less um, about um, you know the animal itself and its its functional role as a pollinator, that will really help to to move things forward and and um, you know save our native biodiversity before it you know becomes locally extinct or we get um, ecosystem collapse. What we're, where we're going with the project, so what next, what we're doing in these habitats is we're starting to look at what impact it's having on other wildlife. So here we've got a Bombus vegans visiting a shrubby St. John's wort. And here is a, um, a yellow white-throated sparrow eating the seeds on this St. John's wort. I don't know if it's the same plant, but it's in the same habitat later in the season. So the white-throated sparrow is a bird species of conservation concern. It needs to have cover close to the ground to forage. So shrubby St. John's wort is a perfect plant for this, this bird to feed. But here we're, we're forming the connections. The pollinating that was done, um, sorry. Pollinating that was done earlier in the season is, is those pollination products are helping other wildlife. And here we've got purple giant hyssop. And so if we look at this video, you see all the movement. These are all birds feeding on the purple giant hyssop seed. This is at Breakneck Hill in the South Borough. We just don't see bird abundance and diversity like this, um, you know, throughout the rest of the of the the site. So, you know, we're starting to look at these connections and which plants are are really benefiting um, wildlife of, of conservation. So, making those connections and restoring those those systems. With that, I'd like to thank you very much for your time, and I'm happy to take um, any questions. Great. Thank you so much, Dr. Jagir. We do have a couple of questions lined up. So first, I'm going to ask Lisa Wolf if you'd like to ask your question. You have your hand raised. If you may need to unmute yourself. Lisa, do you have a question you'd like to ask? 
Okay. Well, we'll come back to you, um, or you can feel free to um, add your question into the Q&A section. So let's see. Can you give some specifics about what plants on the list are changing in or out? We've got some uh, inquiring minds before before the list oh, is. <laughs> yeah, uh, excellent. Uh, so if you need to know now, you could send me an email and I'm happy to send you the list. I, I There isn't, there aren't major changes. Um, it's going to be modified somewhat. As I said, a lot of the skippers are um, like native grasses, and the um, you know the the fritillaries are are on violet. So I don't think there are major changes in terms of plants, bumblebee plants. Um, I'm not sure that there are going to be any major changes. I made some changes at the end of last year that I think will carry through. Um, I just haven't had time to sit down and think about the butterfly side and how things have changed. So I'm assuming there will be some changes, but I, I think you can use the 2022 list and you're not, I'm not removing anything from the list that I have, the existing list that I have, so. Okay, great. Um, and then there's a request, if you could go back in your presentation to the list of the good plants to add to your garden. It was just before you showed the images of your lawn. Yeah. Yes, and again, I'd uh, like, add that we have recorded this um, presentation and we can provide the link to attendees. I'll, I'll make sure that that's in the follow-up email as well, as as well as links to all of um, Dr. Jagir's websites, the other places he's referenced, and the Freedom's Ways programs and opportunities too. So here's that. So I assume this is the, the slide that you were referring to. So this is Penstemon Hirsutus here in Digitalis, and this is giving you the order of bloom. So um, this wood betony is early in the in the spring and would bloom just after at the same time as some of the willows. Um, so the willows are a good source of nectar and pollen if it's a male, it's got both. And there are willows, um, the prairie willows, some of the, they're smaller, more shrubby willows that don't, that are easier to control and better for, um, you know, gardens and backyards. I know willows get a bad rap, but but the willow goes into the the native roses, which are important. Oops, I don't know why it keeps doing that. Um, native roses, which are important. The St. John's wort shown here, shrubby St. John's wort is great. And then there's giant St. John's wort. If you've got a wetter soil, it's really good um, source of pollen. The flowers are huge, so very showy. Um, but I'd say on this list, the purple flowering raspberry, if you need a privacy fence, but as a source of pollen, that purple flowering raspberry blooms for over a month um, in my hands anyway. And it is covered. Like you can hear, I can go out my back door and hear the bumblebees buzzing to get the nectar. And it's not just bumblebees, it's everything that needs pollen is all over purple flying raspberry. So it's a really, uh, really good one. And then meadow sweets also a, a really good one later in the summer. So that'll get you to fall. Um, the cell feel, you know, some of these um, are blooming for over longer periods, cell feel is interesting. You put it in your lawn and you mow it, it will adapt to the how high your mower is. It will bloom low. And as you cut it, it will extend the bloom for, for cell, cell feel. But um, purple giant hyssop is a great one. And then the showy goldenrod. So all goldenrods are not the same. Showy goldenrod is, if you look at what's on a showy goldenrod versus other goldenrods, it's, it's, there's no comparison. So we're seeing that a lot of butterflies, we're looking at nectar production, but um, you know, th those that goldenrod is supporting a lot of, so supporting the bumblebees that won't really visit those other goldenrods. So showy goldenrod stands on its own when it comes to goldenrods. Great, so uh, we have a follow-up question on this slide. How did yeah. you get wood betony started? Um, they haven't seen it offered in seed. So it was offered in seed and it didn't, um, the seeds were all dead that year. I was recommending it to a number of people and I tried it myself and we got the seeds tested, um, but you can get plugs. So it comes with a native grass or a sedge um, as plugs. And that's what I did last year. And it's it, it took off, bloomed the first year and the plants um, by the end of the summer look great. So I would suggest to go that way. And if you need help, uh, finding a source, just email me and I'm happy to, to give it to you. Okay, great. Once those once those plants are, by the way, once those plants are in the ground, so this is what Southboro's doing and some other places, um, 
are starting up is that that I put in these habitats and support them and you can collect the seeds and then distribute the seeds and then have winter sow events. So I think this is the third year at Breakneck in Southboro. Freddie Gillespie's leading that and it's been tremendously successful. People are getting these plants into their backyards and not surprisingly, they're starting to see the target species show up in their backyards. So um, that pay it forward, this is, consider this to be more of a grassroots um, type thing, um, but it's been really successful expanding the project. Okay. Another question on wood, uh, wood betony, um, does it need a wet environment? No, no, it doesn't need um, anything special. Um, I think it's a medium soil. So if you look at my plant list, I've got type of soil and um, I mean, it, it can't be ultra dry, like a, like a rose, um, but it's a medium soil. I've got it in medium soil at multiple sites and it's doing, doing well at all those sites. I, I mean, I'm three years into it or two years into it. So maybe they'll crash, but last year was pretty dry and they survived that. So I think they'll they'll do okay at those sites. Okay, so we have just a couple more minutes. Uh, if anyone else would like to ask a question question to Dr. Jagir, please put it in the Q&A. Okay. Um, so let's see. I do deadhead, but that leads to more flowering. And then seeds are still produced later in the season. So this person's a bit confused about what the problem would be in that situation. Well, because the the seeds are are they're they're using the seeds as food as they're produced. So I mean, if you have seeds available, that's fine. The deadheading I'm referring to is the 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 people that cut everything back and remove that from the the landscape. Um, if eventually you're going to leave the seeds, that's fine. The point I'm trying to make is that those seeds are feeding something. And if you remove them, that whatever it's feeding is not going to have a food option. Mm. Trying to make that point. Okay. All right. Are there any other questions out there? Or Dr. Jagir, is there anything else you'd like to add before we wrap up tonight? Uh, no, if you just if you have any, I'll go back to the last slide. If you have any questions, here's my email. I'm happy to answer any questions that, um, that you might have about plants or ideas, whatever, whatever your question is, I'm happy to answer. All right, great. Well, thank you so much. And again, um, there will be a follow up email with all of these resources, as well as the registration links to our new, to upcoming webinars there. And I know that we have some um, of our partners, especially the Lincoln Land Conservation Trust that host plant sales that will be coming up in the next couple of months. So we'll make sure to send that information along as well. And with that, I'd like to thank you, Dr. Jagir, for your time tonight and sharing um, this wealth of information with us and for all of the attendees. Um, thank you so much. Have a great evening.